everybody. This is Marilyn, CEO and founder of Cosmic Centaurs, and as always, your host for the fourth annual edition of the Cosmic Conference. I'm excited to have you all with us today. This year, our five-week-long conference is hybrid and includes in-person sessions in Dubai and Riyadh, as well as online sessions right here on LinkedIn Live, just like this one. Our focus this year is all about helping you lead organizations that deliver. We're exploring this topic through five sub-themes, five weeks, five themes. The first one, strategy execution, scaling, transformation, and this week's theme, capability development and restructuring next week. From October 6th till October 11th, we are joined by thought leaders and academics who share their insights, knowledge, and perspectives for a total of 11 online sessions and five in-person events, all of which are free to attend we're often asked why, and the reason is we measure our impact by how many people we help and how many people we learn with, not what revenue we make or what we sold to whom. And that's why our content is always free to watch and attend. But recently, someone asked us how they could thank us for all of this work. So we had to think about it. Now we have an answer. You can donate to our Cosmic Centaurs Fund, dedicating to supporting women re-enter the workforce, or if you have time to spare, 15 minutes to be precise, you can take our Future of Teams survey in partnership with Dr. Connie Hadley from Boston University, all about understanding what makes people engaged and happy at work. As I mentioned, this week we're kicking off the fourth week of the conference and our theme is capability development. What we often see in many organizations is that the strategy exercise ends too early. The scope of strategy stops at the strategic choice. But what we know is that for successful strategy execution, in fact, even for successfully choosing the right strategy, that capability gap assessment is not a nice to have. It's a must have. How often have we seen leaders sign off on a strategy without looking into whether or not the org has the capabilities to deliver. And in fact, 70% of employees believe they lack the skills needed to do their job. And it is the role of leaders to evaluate the capabilities of the organizations to ensure that they're ready to develop the capabilities needed to deliver on the strategy. We will be unpacking this and more with our guests this week, today with Susan, later this week with Dr. Christian Mueck, and then on Friday for our fourth in-person event in partnership with Crayon, where we will be discussing how to bridge the capability gap. Before we begin, begin, show us some love, give this video a like, maybe tag someone who you think might enjoy it, and as always, be generous with your comments and your questions. Susan and I will try our best to get through those before the session ends. Today's guest is Susan Chartouni, Senior Director, EMEA LATAM, Field and Channel Marketing at Palo Alto Networks. She is experienced in developing go-to-market strategies, using data and analytics and execution to meet the business goals and results. She's passionate about customers, technology, and people, and is an advocate of a growth mindset and collaborative leadership. Sue, we are thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Marilyn. I'm very excited to be here today. Yeah, likewise. And, you know, you and I both share a passion uh, for capability development in our teams, and we will be discussing all of that, but also discussing how to lead in a global organization. Strategy and strategy execution take on a whole other meaning uh, when we are far away from HQ and in the distributed settings. Um, global organizations are, of course, by nature distributed, and leading those teams also comes with its own challenges. Um, but we know, and there's a lot of research, including this piece from McKinsey, that shows that businesses that invest in capability development enjoy better returns and higher organizational health scores. There are many ways to develop the capabilities and skills of your teams, from creating whole new departments, outsourcing a capability, investing into a structured L&D approach, or even internal knowledge sharing initiatives like mentorship. And Sue, I asked you on here because you are one of those leaders who is so intentional and invested in developing the capabilities of your team. Um, and in our work together over the last few years, we've done this in many, many different ways, from hands-on change management to skills development. We'll share more about that um, over the next 40 minutes or so, but let's get this started. I think my first question to you, when, when we were preparing for this, um, we counted the number of countries that your team oversees. So within the EMEA and LATAM scope, 
Um, your team serves over 150 countries across many, many different regions, languages, you know, with all the complexity. And the added complexity is that you don't operate out of the home country or the country where HQ is, uh, which is always something when it comes to global organizations. So my first question really is, how do we go from understanding the overarching global strategy in order to localize it and meet the specific needs of the regions that we oversee? I think that's a first really important step before we even get to capabilities to talk about the strategy piece. Thanks, Marilyn. But I guess the first thing, and I say it smiling, is that first you have to read it, <laughs> read the strategy of the global company. Um, a lot of time when it's communicated to you, you have like the summary, what we're trying to achieve and then how we're going to measure it. It's important to ask about the details of the strategy and to read what got to that point. Uh, most of the companies would share that, the leaders, and if they're not able to share, to share the full document, you can ask the question. I think that it starts with me. I try to understand what the strategy is about, why it was chosen, what are we trying to achieve, and then try to do the, map the mapping to the region that I'm responsible for with my team. First thing, so yes, understand. So the second thing is to actually communicate it to the team and to the different stakeholders that you have to be able to define the strategic priorities for the regions that you're responsible for aligned to the global strategy. Um, which takes me back to, if you don't understand it, you can't communicate that one. Well. <laughs> Um, so working with the different stakeholders, depending on the function that you're in, I'm in marketing, of course, so I need to work with the business uh, leaders or the go-to-market leaders to discuss the global strategy and then um, discuss the market nuances that we have and how can we actually adapt or adopt this strategy to the regions that we're responsible for. So of course, you need to do market research, there should be some analytics around that and analysis competitive landscape, um, understanding the different geo, uh, geographical differences and geopolitical differences, um, uh, understanding the cultures of the customers from one country to another, also understanding what are your business leader uh, tasked to achieve this year. So understanding their goals, what do they have to achieve? What is the strategy that is coming top down to us? And with all these different nuances, you can define your strategic priorities and like a subset of strategy for the region. The other thing that's very important to do when I do this is I make sure that I don't make that decision on my own. So I involve the stakeholders to be part of that decision so we can all be accountable and responsible and in agreement that this is the way forward. Then last but not least, we have to communicate it back to the global team. As in, this is the global strategy. This is what you want to achieve. This is how we believe in our patch we can map our priorities based on where we are in terms of market share, et cetera, to the global strategy, and that's how we're going to measure it. Yeah, absolutely. I think so many of these points um, ring so true. I mean, they may sound obvious, but actually they're not obvious at all. I think the number was that only 24% of employees are actually aware of their organization's strategy. So while it may sound so obvious to say, start by reading it, um, first of all, not all organizations share their corporate strategy with their employees, which I always find fascinating. I'm not sure how we're supposed to execute on something we have never been privy to. Um, but also to your point, many people don't really take the time to truly understand it. And for many, there's also this assumption that the corporate strategy should have already solved for their local problems. And I think what you bring up is really essential. I mean, it's not corporate strategy's job to understand the local nuances. Corporate strategy's job is to set the overall direction of the organization. In a good organization, corporate understands that there will be local nuances and changes to be brought and is open to that two-way street, I think, um, of receiving feedback from their regional counterparts and, and being able to manage that. But in a lot of what you spoke about too, you know, you mentioned a lot of your various stakeholders from explaining it to your team, aligning with your business leads, bringing the conversation back to your um, many, many stakeholders, including corporate. Um, I think, you know, stakeholders definitely play such an essential role uh, in the success or failure, particularly of global organizations where there are more and more people to align. Um, talk to us about your approach to stakeholder management. I know you're someone who's very, you know, intentional and um, takes time to really reflect on how to approach it in a way that is win-win for everybody. 
Sure. Um, I think when you think about stakeholders, it's not only employees and your peers in terms of leadership, but it's also the partner community, uh, which we rely on heavily in the Inyarata market to, to expand into the businesses and the customers. I think you start with a very clear communication. That's very, very important. And with the local context education, right? You need to understand if you don't know it to make sure that you educate yourself um, about the local context for specific countries. Um, obviously, when you hire people, um, I've learned a long time ago to hire people that are better than me at doing the job that I want them to hire, that I want them to do because they're there to do it, right? So a lot of them would know better about the cultural differences and what you need for this country. So here, communication, understanding the context, understanding what are the goals of the different stakeholders and what would make them successful. And then sharing your own goals to see how we can map that. And most of the time, like I've been lucky in an organization where these goals are already in mind, but if it's not, it's a good discussion to figure out like how can we resolve this? How can I make you successful and be successful? But also how to go back to the global team and say, hey, this is not aligned. I can't su support the business if I need to move in that direction. And it's okay to be able to go back to other stakeholders and discuss this because you have to set expectation early on and you have to raise the flag to ensure that you're successful throughout the year. Um, involving them in the decision-making process is very, very important. So they feel that we're building this together. Uh, you mentioned that I care a lot about um, making sure that's a win-win situation. But the point is like, you can't win on your own <laughs> in your organization, special global organization. Uh, winning is collective. So it also doesn't matter if you win as your team, but the rest of the team or other other departments are failing because we fail as an organization. So you have to put yourself last. You have to put the organization first and the team first, and you will come through that at the end. Um, I think uh, when you do all this and you try to add value and build this kind of communication with the different stakeholders, that also helps you develop better relationship and trust. And that's the foundation for everything, right? Um, people are not going to work with you if they don't trust you. You're, you won't be able to be very collaborative and to move fast and agile if there is no um, a base for trust and collaboration uh, between teams. Um, I think when I talk or think about stakeholders, I also like to make sure that I keep them up to date about the strategic goals that we've defined on the long term and then break the problem into smaller pieces, right? Like what are we gonna, if this is the long-term objective, how are we gonna achieve it? And then make sure there's a regular cadence to communicate that and to discuss what's working, what's not working. Very important success and failures because we learn much more from failures than successes. Um, the other thing in terms of stakeholders, depending on the situation, sometimes you don't have the right resources to do the job that is required to achieve that mm -hmm. strategy. So looking into, do we need to reshuffle a bit the organization, add additional responsibilities to some people or hire new people with specific capabilities to cover that patch? This is very important. Um, I think what's so brilliant about what you're saying, again, some really great fundamentals there is starting from a place of knowing that we all succeed together. And we all, no matter, even if it doesn't look like that, actually, we should all want the same thing. Oftentimes, we'll find leaders forget that. They start to, um, you know, disagree or silo away from each other. Uh, but in fact, the success of the company is their own success. And I think it's really, you know, a beautiful mantra to actually remember that that's what we're all working towards. And then I think what is really beautiful about how you do it, and again, you might take this for granted, but I don't think a lot of people do, um, do it this way, is that you start from a place of giving. You start from a place of empathy and understanding uh, and relationship building. And in the end, it is those relationships that um, allow an organization at scale to fail or succeed. Yes, we have assets and we have competitive advantage and we have a lot of things. But we all know that if the humans refuse to collaborate, nothing is going to happen. Um, and you come from that place of giving. And I think... Um, one really great point that you mentioned, and I know for having known you for a few years that it's something you're very disciplined about, and it wasn't part of our prep, but since you mentioned it, I want to um, have you talk over this point just a little bit. You are incredibly 
structured at managing your cadence. In fact, that is something that you review almost on a quarterly, quarterly basis, whether it's your own internal team cadence or it's your cadence with the other stakeholders within the organization or your partners that you um, that you want to make sure that you engage properly. Just talk to us a little bit about that cadence piece and why it is an essential element of your success in that in that approach. That's really funny because I'm actually not organized at all in my personal life. <laughs> I like to keep my personal hours completely spontaneous and then free. Uh, and I guess because I know that I have that tendency to let things go, that I put a much stricter cadence on myself to ensure that I adopt different structure in the workspace. Um, I learned it from many leaders. I, I'm someone who's very curious. I'm someone who observes a lot and is constantly on the pursuit of learning and then to, do, to become a better human being, but also better at my job and ensure that my team also get better. Um, so multiple leaders, I've seen how they've evolved. One of them actually is my husband, who has a management operational rhythm, who's a very strong sales leader. And then uh, I learned that tactic from him, is that like you just define what are the key conversations and key measurement um, and uh, the measurement reporting uh, meetings that need to happen during a quarter. That if you only do this, you, you're definitely successful and you have done all the right conversations. That also includes an exercise of stakeholder mapping. Who are the key stakeholders I need to connect to? How often? And the other thing is like, what's the value that I'm bringing into these meetings? It's not about just, hey, I need to connect with you. Let's set up a weekly meeting and then I have nothing to add you know, like to share. So making sure that there's a clear agenda. It really starts with just building that structure. And then if I know what I want to achieve and who are the people I need to connect with and what's the outcome and the output that I need to deliver in my role and for these stakeholders, then I, this is how I find usually my, my uh, cadence. I also include in my calendar the time to write content, to respond to emails, um, to review certain things, because obviously my calendar controls my life outside the weekend. So <laughs> that's how I do it. Yeah, I think there's discipline will set you free. And uh, you, you know, you're very yeah. conscious about managing that discipline. Um, you know, another one of your key stakeholders, and you did mention them earlier, and now we want to deep dive into the heart of the topic, is obviously your team members and the people who report into you. Uh, you know, we said earlier that 70% of employees don't think they have the skills needed to do their job, um, but you're also someone, and, and we've been brought to do a number of missions together, helping develop the capabilities of your team, whether it's improving processes and ways of working to developing new skills. You're someone who's um, you know, very thoughtful and very thorough in thinking through the capabilities needed for your team to be successful. You just mentioned, you know, hiring a new person, adding um, elements to their roles and responsibilities. Um, talk to us about your approach to capability development um, over the years and, and what you focus on. Uh, okay, that's, that's a great question. I think... Um, it, it starts with understanding the scope of the role, the, the department, the organization. And when you define the goals as a team, let's say from marketing to the business team, it's also about defining um, what's the value that you're gonna bring to that team and what do the sales leader care about, right? There's the corporate goals, there's the company goals, but there's also the rapport that you need to establish between those teams. And usually based on that, um, I actually do the, the like I do a reverse kind of a thing. I I know what kind of outcome and outputs I need to get to. Then I try to define what is the behavior or the processes or what do we need to do to get to those outcomes, and then identify the skills. Now, obviously, now with experience, <laughs> this comes to me naturally. But I used to simply go on the internet and then search. Okay, I need someone who can do one, two, three. Oh, this requires someone who is good at decision making. So, and then I would define the, the CV based on that. Or the other way around, like someone who needs to be stronger at decision making. What are the different things, uh, trainings, approaches that someone needs to do to be able to become a stronger decision maker? Um, now, when it comes about strategy, I think about my team's skill set. Uh, we've done that exercise here and me. Um, I think the first thing, if you, if you can't think strategically, you really won't be able neither to execute on strategy 
nor to define your own subset of strategies. And that's very important. People think that you can execute on strategy without necessarily being able to think strategically. I personally don't think like that because I think for every role that you have in the organization, you need to understand why you're doing it and the role that you play, no matter how small you are in the bigger scope of things, right? So maybe you're responsible to reach certain numbers, but these numbers will contribute to a bigger number that will contribute to the overall goal. And this is very important for me. So from the smallest uh, role to the biggest role, you need to be able to have that strategic thinking. Um, obviously, communication is very, very important because you want to be able to explain the why for employees or to the stakeholders what the strategy is about, how we're going to achieve it, why do we need to and then to drive alignment. Um, and the rest is about project management, of course, uh, uh, execution details, relationship building, managing conflict. Managing conflict and negotiation are very, very strong skill set that you need to have um, uh, when it comes to defining strategy because you deal with so many different people and you want to be, again, thinking about the collective winning. How do you manage that? How, how do you go back to the original goal and make sure that the team refocus on that rather than the problem at stake? Um, also, when you're training uh, people leaders, um, mm -hmm. they need to learn how to delegate. And that's a very important element. So if you don't know how to delegate and then how to empower your team and also recognize the motivational cycle of your employees. Some of them might be like super motivated and they're reaching a plateau. Some of them are still in the coaching. They need to grow. They're a bit skeptic. So that's a very, very important um, skill to teach your leaders because one leader cannot just push down the strategy if he brings other leaders to be trained and probed and then to believe in that strategy that cascades down. So that's a very important process. Um, and yeah, and the learning to how to measure your progress, be accountable to the progress that you're doing. That's very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you th I think you mentioned one really interesting point, and then there are two questions from the audience that I want to bring up over here. Um, the interesting point for me um, also in what you said just now is as you're thinking about the capability development of your team, you're thinking about two very different tracks. The first is those what I would call or what one could call the hard skills or the technical skills or the let's call them the left brain skills, right? The strategic thinking, the decision making, the stakeholder management, the communication. Like these are things that you can put on a slide and, they, and you can explain using frameworks and very clear techniques. And on the other end, you did mention they should also be really good at managing their own people because that's how you scale an organization. Um, and so delegation, empowering others, emotional intelligence, um, being able to recognize where someone is on that curve and supporting them in that process. And I think that it's that ability to kind of see both of those things at the same time that makes these programs or, or any initiative that you put in place really effective. A first question from Mubashira here, um, she asks, on capabilities of developing your team, what factors do you focus on? So you did mention kind of looking at the end state and working backwards from there, but what other factors do you focus on when you're designing or thinking through what capabilities your team needs to develop? So I think it's an interesting question, and I'm not going to answer it just when you build teams for execution of strategy. It's about building teams in general. I'm a big believer in diversity. So diversity of skill set, of backgrounds, of, of anything that you can bring to the table. And the more diverse your team is, the stronger it is, because then you are collectively having the best types of skill set as a group, right? So when I'm hiring, when I even when I consider to hire someone for the job, Every job requires a certain level of skill set in terms of how to deal with the stakeholders and the market and the partners or like the customers. But I also take into consideration how can I ensure that my team is collectively diverse and then can empower each other. The simple exercise that we done we do every organization will offer it is to do a personality test. There are the simple ones, you have the disk, you have much more the ones, and you have some personality tests that talk about uh, how do you behave in the workplace and how do you behave as a leader. And that's your best learning. When you understand the different spectrum of skill set um, that are available in the world and you see it and you try to complete it, that's, 
that's really the basis of everything for me. Um, yeah, and, and, I, and I mean, love, sorry, yeah. I was just commenting, like, I love that you think about this, not just as an individual, but a collective. It's like forming the Avengers. You don't need all of the yeah. Avengers to have the same skill sets, but together no. they're really good at defeating very bad people. <laughs> it's, it's very, very true. And personally, at some point in time uh, in my career, I had to lead an organization with another person. And that person is actually one of the closest people to me professionally. Um, and we are, if you, and you know that person, Marilyn, um, if you look at our personality, we're like black and white, <laughs> completely different. But, and we were leading an organization that really required cohesiveness and required to build a strong team culture, make sure that that team becomes master of change and uncertainty. So if we were, if we are strong collectively as a team, no matter what you throw in our face, we were able to really take it forward and make it happen. Um, and I think it's because we already have that trust established. We, we've leveraged each other's strengths that were very different. And now I've learned to do things the way he does them and then vice versa. Uh, that was a great exercise, a personal development exercise that made me realize that I wanna have more people like that in my team. I don't want someone that is like me. I need someone who can do something that I can't do or someone that can bring something that I don't understand, but they have the experience for it, right? So that's how uh, you decide. And of course, every function changes, every department changes. So it's really about understanding what it is about, what makes them successful, what are the key uh, skill sets, and then build the whole organization around it. Yeah, absolutely. Another great question here from Marie is, you know, there are many different ways um, that we measure the effectiveness of our skills development or our L&D programs or, our, you know, capability development programs. What do you look for in order to be able to say, this was worth our investment, our time, uh, I can see that there are good outcomes here. What are you looking to see when, after these kind of uh, efforts? Consistency is key, right? So if I if I offer a training, whatever I'm asking the person to do in terms of development, it could be a special project, it could be improving on communication and setting a better cadence, or an actual external training, right? Um, first, you need to be able to get that person or your team to present back their learning and to take immediate action into how am I going to apply this in my work life or even in my personal life. And then make them commit to it, to a wider audience. <laughs> so to the rest of the team, moving forward, I'm going to do this. This is my new project. I'm going to push for that. Um, that's the first thing to ensure that the skill set has been learned because you have to practice it. It's very important to practice it. And then after that, you want to be consistent in that. It needs to be something that becomes part of your day-to-day -day values. Um, and it requires awareness around that. It's very important that you maintain that awareness about what kind of a person you want to be in the workspace and what are how do you want to behave into that role and to remember that this is what you need to do on a daily basis. Eventually, like any new skill set, it's a muscle. So you just, you practice it, it becomes a reflex, right? So repetition eventually turns into a reflex. <laughs> Absolutely. There are two questions from the audience, okay. one from Maya and one from Rhea, and they're similar to each other in some ways. So Maya asked, how can a leader address the diverse learning styles of team what? members? Uh, because we don't all learn in the same ways. And similarly, um, here Rhea is asking about, uh, on larger teams, you have different people at different levels with different goals who need different things. So again, the diversity of how they learn and what they're hoping to accomplish. And how do you make sure that um, whatever you're designing for them is inclusive? I think, so first you need to identify what is the common learning style for the wider group. That's an important element to see what's most likely to work on the wider audience. But when in doubt, for some people, where you feel that you're struggling with this traditional way, ask them. Like, just ask, like, I want you to learn about this. This is important. And I explain why that skill set is important for their current career, for the role that they're delivering and their growth. And I ask what's the best way for them to learn. I, have, I had people 
uh, asking me for coach to get coaches or leadership coaches to do sessions for them in their local language. And this is an important element in the global organization to understand that multi language capabilities, yes, English is important, it's the main language, but a lot of people feel more comfortable in then mother tongue to learn about certain skills or to express themselves. Um, some people are more visual, some people prefer to listen to podcasts. If I can offer it, I'll do my best. If, if the company doesn't have this, I try to find a training external that um, that connects better with the with the team that I have. And then I ask for budget to fund it. And so far, luckily, I've always received that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, from as a trainer, you know, on the other side of this, um, it's important it, that you find a trainer who understands that too, meaning that in their content, they're integrating different ways of learning. So there's no way that well, in a four-hour workshop, there's no way that 100% of the content works for 100% of the attendees. We all know that. But I think if you make sure that the way that the content is being designed or delivered, there is a diversity of, it appeals to the conceptual people, it appeals to the tactical people, it's visual and it's not, it's practical and it's theoretical. Like I think different people learn through um, different means, um, even if they're in the same classroom. So I think not aiming for that 100% for 100%, but rather making sure that there's enough diversity in the way the content is presented, that it matches the diversity of the people in the room. This is an approach that I like in Cosmic Center as well, is that you, you don't focus only on the practical or the tools that we the team can use, uh, but also you ensure that there's a practical element to test it, right? You give them homework, they come back. And from my side, I want to see how they've uh, implemented this, right? The other thing is if someone needs to develop a skill set in a certain area, here there will probably be some stakeholders who will be receptive to, to that skill set, right? So asking for feedback on the progress is important, not necessarily as a manager <laughs> to these stakeholders. But to proactively, I encourage my team to go speak to these stakeholders, discuss this element that I have to develop. And then as they're working through it, to constantly ask for a feedback loop. And that helps keep them in check until it becomes part of their nature. Yeah. Before we move on to the strategy execution piece, one last question from the audience that I think it's relevant to go over here, um, which is um, about the fact that with so much of the workforce being remote, um, it gets harder and harder to engage everyone at the same level. And I think in a in a global company, people are remote even from before the pandemic. Like it's not a new thing. It's not that yeah. suddenly we are now remote. And so there's a lot to learn from that. Uh, <clears throat> but how do you how do you think about engaging people when you're on a distributed team? Well, uh, that was a big thing for us uh, during COVID, and you worked with me on that, Marilyn. Um, well, there are different elements. Communication, transparent sharing is very, very important, right? Making sure that you reach out to people. First, defining the communication means, right? We use emails, we use Slack, we use uh, <coughs> Google, whatever you're going to use, define and define the channels that are there to communicate what exactly and make sure that your team is accountable on that. Like there's a way to make sure, like I know, I love I love WhatsApp, not for business. <laughs> like you can do, you have the delivered, you see that it's been read or like now in Slack or other tools, you can ask your team to do a thumbs up to make sure that it was received. So first is really ensuring that there's a clear communication, the channels are identified and everybody understands how to use them. That's very, very important. You need to be transparent. You need to ensure that you have regular updates and feedback. You want your team to provide feedback. And then if you notice that most of the time, there's one or two people who never speak up, reach out to them and ask and make sure that they understand. Um, whether you as a leader or your people leaders, it, this is very important. Um, I think you wanna be able also to foster inclusivity uh, in that one. So you want to ask for people in a wider group about, um, what do you think of that? This is the, the new way forward. Are you all on board? Where are your challenges? Where are your concerns? Do you believe you can be successful or not? So just encourage them to be more outspoken 
before they just go and run <laughs> in execution mode. Um, that's very important. The other thing that I think helps a lot is how, and this is a skill set, defining and cascading the goals and the expectation to the different teams. Because like a global role or a theater role is not a goal, it's not necessarily the same goal that every person needs to have. So how to um, dissect these goals into smaller goals and distribute them to the different teams based on their function or how they can, what they need to achieve is very, very important and explaining it to them. So that helps a lot in the distribution team. Provide them with the tools and be consistent in measuring the results all across. So it's not like I have a team that measures in a way and a team that measures in a different way. That also will encourage collaboration. And then when you do like business reviews or like a retrospective or uh, bi-weekly reviews, there's a consistent way of how we communicate the progress and the results that brings people um, more together into that. Um, yeah. I think you're you're and kind of also th this answer is taking us to uh, yeah sorry you wanted to add something I just wanted to add another thing I think um, you need to show trust to your team and you want to encourage innovation like in distributed teams it's very very important to tell them that I trust you because I know that I've hired the best I know that these are capabilities that you're going to do this I'm giving you that trust to achieve that and you give them the trust to be able to be more innovative and allow failure when needed because this is how you get the best results actually when you allow people to, to to fail at some point but then overachieve in other areas and this is very very important when you don't have that culture of trust or what you stand for as a team it will hinder communication it will hinder results it will create an overall atmosphere of energy even sometimes on zoom calls or like team calls where you feel that there is no cohesiveness. So working on that is very important. And other thing you have to reward and you have to recognize and you have to create team building activities. The culture is very, very important in distributed teams. I, I mean, I love everything you're saying because actually what you're saying is the fundamentals of building human relationships are no different. And in the same way that you have to be intentional and disciplined about doing them in real life, real life, in the office, in a shared space, you also have to do that um, when you're distributed with the added layer of that extra trust and extra faith that everybody shows up wanting to do their best work every day. No one shows up to work wanting to fail. I mean, some people do, but for many, many different reasons that we're not going to go into, but mostly people just want to succeed. And, and again, having that discipline, it goes back to your cadence piece as well. To not drop the ball on these things is how you keep people engaged no matter where they're sitting. <clears throat> I think another piece that you know we're we're inching towards as well. Of course, this conference is all about strategy execution, and I think we've covered quite a bit of the good discipline behind strategy execution, from that goal cascading that you were just talking about, from um, the stakeholder engagement piece, the internal communications piece. You you already mentioned so many key elements of strategy execution. Um, are there any other aspects that you think are key to keep top of mind? in that strategy execution piece? Uh, I think, yeah, I think risk management and communication of risk is very, very important. Um, and managing expectations. Uh, a lot of time when you take a strategy, even when we define it at an EMEA level, it might not work well for a particular country. Right, because of different cultural nuances, because of something that's happening currently geopolitically, or because of maybe local policy. Um, I think being able to highlight those elements, to, un to identify where it could work, where it doesn't work, and then relate it back to the leadership is a very, very important element when it comes to strategy execution. But also to come up with an alternative is more important, because like otherwise, this is like you're just pushing back and not doing anything, right? So you want to, again, think about the collective win. So if that doesn't work, what else can we do? Do we want to focus on something else versus that point until we're ready in that market to reach to that next level? Um, so I'm trying to think if there's something else. Uh, so we talked about... Um, yeah, I mean, we talked about the goal. 
is that too I'm not sure if I'm the one, if it's my connection or if it's yours, Marianne. Um, so I'm going to keep talking <laughs> in the meantime. Um, I think you need to also make sure that you're paying attention, that doing a regular exercise about the small picture and the big picture. Having that skill set to be able to zoom in and zoom out is a very, very important skill set. Um, that you need to practice as a team and you need to constantly review and be agile and adaptable in your approach to the execution to, to make sure that if something is changing, the market is changing all the time, you have to be adaptable. So being able to go into the details when needed and then zoom out to look at the big picture to ensure that you're still trying to support the collective win for the organization is very, very important. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I think I had internet troubles, um, but I'm back I now. Uh, I was not sure if it was you or me, so I kept talking. It is definitely like you me. me. No worries. I've been having internet connection problems all day today, so I did warn you this might happen, and it did. I was actually going to say that it's, you know, you talked about risk management. <laughs> Yeah, I think you you froze again, Marilyn. I'm hoping that it's not me. You're back. I feel like I'm back, but I'm not. <laughs> you are back. You are back. All right, here we go. Sorry about that. I don't know what's been happening. I, I live in a very, you know, internet-friendly place, but today it's just been one of those days. Um, yeah, no, I was just okay. mentioning that you... I think we've frozen again. Um, let me talk a bit about the difference. I think one of the things that me and Marine talked about when we were discussing that topic is that I've worked in the past in a, in a small organization, very specific to in Lebanon, right? And then I shifted to a global organization um, throughout my career. And I think the main, one thing that was really beautiful about working in a small organization limited to one country or like to a smaller market is that you get to do multiple roles at the same time. So you get to understand multiple different functions and different perspectives. And I think that made me as an individual and I encourage my team more curious always about the other stakeholders and the other teams to always seek to understand before being understood. And that's really the best exercise you can do to practice looking at the big picture, which you constantly need in your, in your work. From a global perspective, I think the main differences that I that I had to learn, obviously, in my first role, and then you constantly you need to develop self awareness about how you adapt that. Is you have to develop a cultural sensitivity and intelligence. The bigger you are, you're exposed to more cultures that you don't understand, and it's okay that you don't know or understand or are not familiar. But you have to be curious and to understand, because the more you're sensitive to that the better relationship you can build. And when you think about the global organization, networking is not only in your team. You have to network globally. Um, so that's very important. The other thing that I've noticed in global organization is that change is constant. So you have to be adaptable and you have to develop resiliency. These are very, very important elements. And you need to be, and I think this is something that you said to me once, Marilyn, like, are you going to ride the wave or are you just going to, you know, stand in your way and drown? Yeah, I um, think my metaphor is be the wave, not the wall. <laughs> be the wave, not the wall. Exactly. Um, and the other thing is, of course, to understand the markets, understand the legal and regulatory differences in the different countries and the region. And to have, um, there's an expression I used to say, I, it's not coming to me now. But it's like you want to see the big picture while understanding how the local action fits into the broader picture, right? So that, uh, I think when you're frozen, I mentioned it, I hope people heard it, so I wasn't frozen too. Um, the, the capability to zoom in and zoom out when needed is very, very important in any organization, I think, and even in your personal life to be able to step out of a detail when it becomes too intense, 
too detailed. Sometimes it, uh, there are issues with it to be able to step out and look at the big picture and remember the different perspective and what's the ultimate goal there. And then zoom back in when needed to really dig into the details and then figure out uh, what's working, what's not working, and then evolve and innovate based on that. Yeah, I mean, I love that too. And I love talking to you today because, and in general, you know, I think you have a way of simplifying what holistic and uh, leadership means and how to manage complexity um, in a way that is uh, always very positive um, and very, um, you know, accessible. I think that's, I, I can see from the reactions and the comments, you know, uh, uh, the messages that you're sending out are being heard, you know, and you'll see that later on when you check out the comments. But a lot of people are reacting to that. And exactly. I think that's really beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we wrap up, um, we have a few closing questions for you uh, in a rapid fire format. So I'm going to ask you a question or begin a sentence and then I want you to complete it or answer me with a quick and short one. So the first one is great strategy is nothing without execution and tactics <laughs> absolutely couldn't agree more you can't call it a great strategy if it can't be executed um what is the one leadership quality that you think is most useful when you're improving your organization's ability to deliver on strategy i was thinking about that i think for me it's definitely communication because it covers so many different elements but the willingness to grow is also very, very important as a yeah. leader and to develop your team. I couldn't agree more. Um, and then last but not least, what's a book about strategy or strategy execution that every leader should read? Oh, um, well, uh, I, I admit I haven't read too many books about strategy. I think one of with the three, uh, stood with me is the art of war with Sun Tzu but I that's mean, not it I think for me <laughs> be curious like if you want to learn about strategy we're in the internet era we're in the AI era I want like use social media to listen to other leaders watch like if you prefer to read they you always have blogs and stuff I think the best learning about strategy is to understand different examples and then talk about it with our other people. I think that's what made me really learn about strategy more than anything else. I feel like books will reaffirm your learning more than anything. And hey, if you like books, great. It's not that I don't read books either. I do read a lot of books. I'm more into fantasy <laughs> than anything else. Uh, but um, I think the best way, if you want to learn about strategy, find the leader that you like in your company or somewhere else go watch what they're talking about and find someone you trust and then discuss the strategy with them. Because the more you talk to people with different perspectives, the better, the bigger picture you're going to get. And then you learn more about how to develop strategy and different elements. Yeah, I'm, I, I really advice. understand what you're saying. I think I've learned most of what I know about strategy through other leaders and other great thinkers. And then the books and the frameworks and the tools are there to help solidify that learning and maybe give it a yeah. name or a framework or something that's easy to remember. Um, but um, strategy in action is, is always much more interesting. Uh, there are a couple more questions in the audience from okay. Noor, from Mel, and maybe a few more, but I'm not sure that we have time to cover them today, but um, what we can do is we'll go ahead and I'll tag you, Sue, on some of these and maybe you can answer them in the comments. Um, with that, our time together today is coming to an end. But before we go, thank you again so much for your valuable insights today, Sue. It was lovely to have you with us. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you for inviting me. And then, uh, yeah, hopefully see you next time. Yeah, absolutely. And a great big thanks to all of our attendees as well for joining us, for commenting. You couldn't see all of it, but there was plenty of action in the comments. Uh, the video will continue to be available on my page. We'll post it later on YouTube and on our website if you'd like to rewatch it or send it to somebody. All of our sessions are, as I mentioned, free to attend. But if you found this session valuable and you want to give back, you can give back in one of two ways. One is you can donate to our Cosmic Centers Fund dedicated to supporting women re-enter the workforce or by taking, if you have a few minutes to spare, our Future of Teams survey. Both links are in the comments. Um, and of course, as always, you can go on our website, subscribe to our newsletter, and make sure you don't miss out on our upcoming uh, sessions as part of the conference and beyond. Our next session, in fact, this week, 
Uh, we'll be with Dr. Christian Muek, and we'll be speaking about leading the reskilling revolution right here on LinkedIn Live on Wednesday, November 1st at 5 p.m. Thank you again all for being with us, and we hope to see you there.